press people together. So hello, hello everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the EuroPython 2016 session. And uh, we're going to do the talk together. I'm going to do the first few slides and then later on it, Fabio is going to join in. And of course, if you have questions, just feel, feel, feel free to ask uh, during the presentation. Uh, we don't want to put everything at the end because then we used to lose the context. <clears throat> first of all, um, a question. How many of you know what the EPS is? How many don't know? Okay, so the EPS was founded in 2004 when we found that organizing Europython. Europython started in 2002, um, and by 2004 we wanted to have an organization that basically holds the IP rights of the, of the conference and make sure that the, it's a continuous process, that the selection process works for each new uh, location, that the uh, the transfer of knowledge works from one location to the next, and um, the Europython Society was supposed to back up the local organizers at the time. So uh, the way that it worked was that the Europython Society had the, the trademarks, the logo, and the well, it was supposed to have the, the social uh, accounts of for the for the conference. Um, the EPS used to select, just select the, the conference location. It did not actually um, run the conference itself. That was being done by local organizers. But every now and then we, when we switched, we uh, had a CFP process to then determine a new location and then work with the local organizers to actually make it happen. Um, in 2015, we thought that, or we realized that the, the old model of, of doing this would no longer work out because we had serious problems finding new local organizers doing the conference because it, it had grown this big. Um, I mean, this, this year, for example, we have 1,100 attendees. Last year, we had 1,200 attendees. So that's a size uh, where you cannot easily just do the, the conference organization like that on the side. Yeah, it's actually a full-time job uh, for, for quite a few organizers. And so we thought that we use a workgroup model to make it possible to scale this up in a better way. And the workgroups are meant to allow work to be done remotely. So there are lots of things that you can do remotely. For example, you can manage the website remotely. You can do communications remotely. You can do marketing and these things remotely. And um, this is what we started this year for the first time. Um, and it has not yet really uh, worked out all the way, but I think we're, on, we're doing fine in developing this kind of model. And we're definitely going to uh, continue using it. One of the most important things there is that we wanted to reduce the loss of institutional knowledge from location to location. Because we always had, in the past, we always had an issue having the, uh, the knowledge that was gained at one location being transferred to the next location. Usually what happened is that we got a complete new website software set up. So Europython has, I think, about six or seven different website systems right by now. <clears throat> um, the only little details that you, you find when organizing a conference, those details were usually not transferred to the next year. So the same mistakes happened over and over again. And of course, there's a financial risk associated with this, and we wanted to reduce that risk and, um, and have the EPS sign contracts instead of having a local organizer sign the contracts. Now, this year, we tried that. It didn't work out because we couldn't uh, manage the, the uh, VAT taxes with the EPS. The, uh, we tried to get a VAT ID for this, but it, um, the Swedish government wouldn't give us one. So we have to deal with that uh, next year. So the lock, the, under the new structure, the local team is, is meant to just do the on-site work, and we try to do most of the uh, other things remotely. Now, in practice, this for this year, it hasn't really worked out that well. So what happened is that even though we, we had the work groups, most of the active members in those work groups were actually members from the on-site team, plus uh, a few members from the EPS board. <clears throat> but we just started this year, so we have uh, good hopes for, for the next years. Right, so just a few dates maybe to show you how the whole thing developed. In July last year, we had the election of the new board. Um, then in October, we did 
the CFP for EuroPython rather late. Um, by December, we announced the winner, the ACPySS, the Python San Sebastian user group. And in January, mid-January, actually, we started to work with the ACPySS to, to run the conference. So the con conference itself, the whole conference was, was set up in a very, very short time, as you can see. In January 2015, we also, because we started with the workgroups, we set up all the infrastructure for the workgroups. Uh, so we're using mailing lists for that, we're using Lumio for voting, we're using Trello for a few workgroups to, to manage the various tasks. Uh, we set up a pre-launch website to, uh, because people were starting to ask when, uh, where the website was. And we set up this pre-launch pre website because it took a, a bit longer to actually launch, actually launch the, the, the final version of the website. Um, then in March, we managed to get the, the final website uh, running. The website uh, was using the code base that was used in Florence because that was a very complete um, conference software. And as you can see this year, uh, again, there are lots and lots of cool features in that software. And uh, we, once we managed to get it working, it really worked very nicely. And so we didn't have to do anything much to, to make it work like uh, what you see now. So then in March, we also launched ticket sales. And then we ran the call for proposals, again, rather late. Then in April, we had this podcast issue, with, which was the, the, actually the first bigger COC issue that we had. Uh, in May, we had the Fin8 program set up and announced, and um, the talk voting was started. Talk voting was not done last year. It was done in Florence, and it was also invented in Florence. Uh, it was a very good kind of, it, it, it turned out to be a very good way to, to figure out which talks, talk proposals to accept. It works kind of like crowdsourcing um, effort. So basically all the people that have bought tickets can then go to the website and vote on the different uh, talk proposals. And then the program work group would then take those results and based on those results would then uh, go ahead and um, and then actually do the selection. So the, the selection was mainly done on the, based on the results from the talk voting. Um, but the program work group, of course, also um, took care to, for example, increase the diversity of, of, the, um, num of, the, of the speakers, of the uh, number of talks that uh, were done by women. Um, it also took uh, care that each speaker only, well, uh, we, we try to have each speaker only do one talk so that we can get, we can get more and more speakers instead of having one speaker do five talks and the other just uh, maybe one. Um, so I think I'm one of the notable, notable exceptions here because I did, I did one talk for, for your Python in the Python context and I'm now together with Fabio doing two other talks, just the EPS stuff. But this is more on the side of the conference. This is not really uh, uh, the normal case. Right, and then in, um, in June, we had the schedule online. It took a bit uh, to, to get that set up, <coughs> again, because we had a few issues with the website. But we finally figured out how to, to actually publish the website, uh, the uh, schedule on the website. And then in, in July, we followed up with the guidebook application. And now we have EuroPython, and today we have the General Assembly. So overall, it took just six months to organize this conference, which I find really impressive. And, it's, uh, and we really have to thank the local team a lot for this, because uh, without them, this wouldn't have happened. So I think we should give them a, a, a good applause. <laughs> so thank you for that. Right, and just to give you an impression of how the development uh, was with uh, EuroPython, it started very small and with 240 people in Charleroi in Belgium. And then uh, every year, it increased the, the attendee size increased a bit. When we went to Vilnius uh, in, in Lithuania, it went down again a bit because it's a bit far away for many people, but uh, it was still very interesting in Vilnius. Uh, then in Birmingham, it picked up again. And last year we had, with 1,200, we have uh, had the peak so far. 
Uh, in Bilbao, it, it uh, decreased by about 100, which is not really much. And, and given that Berlin is right at the center of everything and it's very easy to get there and um, there, are very, there are very good train connections and everything, so um, it's not surprising that Bilbao has decreased a bit. Um, we hope to increase that again a bit by maybe a few hundred next year. Uh, we have to see how that happens. I think that when, when people go home again and they know how well organized this conference was and how beautiful the location is and um, beautiful Bilbao is, uh, I think they will definitely come back and um, get us more attendees next year. Which is good because, um, I mean, more attendees of, of course also means more work, but it also means more sponsors and, and sponsorship is very important for for the EPS, because in the long run, what we, we, we would like to be is something like a, a European kind of version of the Python Software Foundation, so that we we try to use the conference to, to make money and then to redistribute that money to the European Python community. So what we ideally in the long run would like to have is a grants program where you can go to the EPS and ask for grants for running smaller conferences or running projects in Python. And so we this is our long-term goal for this, and for that we need to increase the sponsorship from what we currently have. At the moment, for this conference, for example, the sponsorship revenue is about 175 or 180 uh, thousand euros, which is really not much. I mean, if you look at PyCon US, PyCon US has way over a million dollars in sponsorship money every year, uh, so there's a, uh, quite a big, they have about, well, between 2,000 and 3,000, I think it's about 2,500 um, at the moment. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, compared to Europython, Europython has about 1,000, but I mean, the, it's just uh, quite double the size, and, but the, the sponsorship money there is, well, I mean, in, in the US it's much easier to get sponsors because they're very open to sponsoring things, and, and in Europe it's not that easy. So we have to try to talk to all the big sponsors at, uh, that we have at PyCon US, for example, whether they would like to do the same kind of thing in, in Europe. You can see that with, with Google, for example, it has worked out great, um, thanks to Fabio's good connections to, to the Google sponsor uh, contact. Uh, they really invested a lot of money this year. Uh, we're trying to do the same with Intel, we're trying to do the same with Microsoft and with Facebook. So we need to get better connections to them, better uh, build better relationships with them, and then make everything bigger. So now I'm going to pass over to Fabio. He's going to talk about the work groups. Uh, hey. We have a slide. We have a slide for that, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's not in this one. Let's see. Um, one thing, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, as Sorry, I, I know Bilbao is in the center of the world, but Berlin is more connected. It, that was the, <laughs> the statement. Um, and um, uh, uh, the other thing was I wanted to mention is that um, I had many people asking about um, how uh, out around um, regarding the website and how they they could they, that it was hard to help and how we chose uh, how come we chose uh, the, the Italian version uh, instead of the last year version, uh, and uh, the background is that we contacted both the main developers of uh, uh, the Italian and the German versions, and based on the support, because we didn't have much resources, um, both uh, were uh, very, they said to be very honored for, for the request, but uh, the, the Italian team uh, turned out to, to be ready to do more, more, more work, so, both, both, it's to say that both soft, but software were great softwares as well. Um, 
one, so the work groups, um, the, the work groups concept uh, we had in mind is that we, we had uh, one group, uh, work group chair person uh, or two, depending on the, the work group size, uh, working members that would focus on, on specific topics, on specific things of, of the conference uh, that could work remotely. Uh, and we could organize those work groups with voting members uh, and a few other working no voting, voting members. Um, the teams were, <coughs> sorry, um, were built uh, looking to set to tackle uh, the conference administration, so having to, to run contracts with the venue, tickets, uh, support, uh, one finance group to control our budget, uh, do accounting, billings, um, check out, the, um, the, um, connect with other or, or work groups that needed something from the budget. Um, sponsors, so for instance, the sponsors and finance were very um, connected uh, work groups. Um, oh, sponsors, of course, had, were, were in charge to contact new sponsors, handle sponsors' logistics, uh, explore sponsors' needs uh, and everything, communications, uh, do press release, uh, community relations. Um, work on the diversity and outreach, uh, code, code of conduct, um, follow up with mailing lists, um, the support, help desk, <coughs> sorry, um, contact attendees, um, uh, help with visas, financial aid, um, handle the grant selection, uh, set up grants, uh, aid, uh, or organize aid, put up information, Marketing, that do their jobs, and the program that uh, Mark, Mark Andre already told about, um, which is repeated. Yeah. Um, the web work group to handle basically the website and everything related. Uh, the media team to do video recording and translations. Um, and of course, the most important team and the, on, the on-site team to handle as a, to, to act as a glue for those those work groups and um, work locally on, on all the providers, the venue, and all the needed uh, regarding catering, uh, printing, logistics, and everything. Um, we uh, we thought since the beginning this was quite important to have guidelines to. Um, get communications right, uh, avoid putting people in a place where they couldn't actually uh, understand where they could, could help. Um, uh, the, the guidelines are necessary, were necessary for those groups also because to, to welcome new people um, and, and address how they could help uh, to keep the knowledge uh, and hopefully uh, act as a code, code base to improve and then near the uh, the new editions. Um, the, the purpose is that the guidelines evolve pretty much in line with the conferences uh, editions. So every year we, we, we learn something new, every year we have new members, new ideas, and we really think that those guidelines should, should just be uh, written by the volunteers and the people doing the conference, and hopefully from the feedback from the people enjoying the conference as well. Um, we did a lot of, uh, we added a lot of content to Wiki uh, and uh, a new Wiki with content. Uh, we, we set up a few procedures and, and documents to handle um, all the, uh, the, the, conf the, the conference workflows and needs. So at the end of the day, this year was, was pretty much uh, a dense year. Um, hard year, but an overall, uh, I think this year was really a big step forward on uh, building something that can stand for, for the future editions. We, we built a lot of things. Uh, many things may not be great um, on, on the workflow side of things, uh, but we really 
I think this is a real proof that um, we, can, we can handle this. Uh, if we could, uh, especially the team from Bilbao, could organize a conference like this in six months with a lot of tension, a lot of small time, and, um, and many unplanned surprises, like, for instance, um, starting with a number uh, of volunteers and ending up with a fraction of that number pretty soon, uh, that proves that we, we really can do incredible stuff. Uh, if we have time, we can do even better. So I guess that's that. Um, <coughs> um, uh, those are your Python con uh, Society contacts. Uh, for information, you can check at the website. So we have a blog. Uh, and every request, uh, there are many channels we, you, you can contact the, the EuroPython Society, even through the board or the mailing list or other channels. So I invite everyone that wants to help to step ahead, help, propose ideas, and keep, keep uh, helping us doing what we do. That's, that's all. Thank you. So. Anybody got questions? <laughs> Hello. So uh, thank you very much for organizing it. It's an amazing conference. Um, I have just just two things I, I wanted to raise. Like um, so, talk voting. So it was really amazing compared to some cent centralized commission which was picking up like a few years ago. Um, the only thing is like. I think that uh, everyone should have like a limited amount of votes that you can give, because otherwise um, you have a, uh, how to say that, lots of talks that had very catchy titles that were not fulfilling the promise. And I think that the catchy title itself, because of the freedom of you know voting for as many talks as you want, I think that it biased those catchy titles towards actually being selected. So. Perhaps Alex wants to say something about that, because he was—he is one of the well, one of the two Alexes anyway. <laughs> it, it just my my only thing is like whenever you are going with the model of crowdfunding or crowd voting, mm -hmm. it's like you always need to introduce the concept of some kind of a currency. Right. Otherwise, if it's unlimited, then you introduce a lot of biases, and it comes from the fact that because everyone has a limited time here. So yeah. basically, yeah, it makes sense that everyone can vote as to as many uh, talks as you can attend. So basically, like 20 or something, and that's it. Yeah. So basically, I can I can answer that directly from the voted program row group. Thanks for the input. Basically, I have some uh, similar results uh, because, but on talk voting, we spend a lot of time on the algorithm com comparing, and it was not just like a number of votes. It was one uh, more complicated thing. It isn't an Oswald algorithm, it's more like preferences. So it does, didn't really matter if you voted for many talks because we didn't not, not only sum up the, the points. Yeah? We did with comparison averages and said, but we finally used the algorithm with all, also uh, Italian brought to us. We, we, mangled, we, we changed it a bit, so there was no possibility of downvoting. Um, uh, but uh, there are some things I think we can improve on the voting process. Uh, because it's, uh, for, for, for me, it's a bit limited only to people having a ticket. I want to suggest that we include people probably having attended one EuroPython because basically we want to build a great conference for attendees, and, but we don't want spamming with people making multiple accounts. So basically, yeah. yeah. What, what was good last year is that there was like some kind of feedback you could give. You could, you could add question to, uh, to the people creating the, the um, Talk. So this yeah. year there, there was. So so my only uh, like issue here is like it's it's actually amazing that that you decided to go this path uh, rather than actually making the whole uh, voting closed. But I, I'm saying like uh, if we really want to achieve the transparency of of the selection, you know either we go with the crowd uh, voting and then. Like, like uh, crowd voting that is fully transparent, or like some hybrid system where 
you say like you can vote, but actually you don't vote because after that there will be some algorithm that would do something with whatever you did actually whatever you vote for. It's I mean it's it's, it's all uh, available on the website and it's uh, it's just nothing really hidden. The, the way that it worked was that we um, basically used the system, looked at all the voting results, and then uh, the voting results were then used by the program work group to then make the actual selection. So what, for example, the, the program group did was instead of having 10 talks about uh, maybe, I don't know, Async I.O., yeah, which is very popular this year, uh, they just selected a few of those and then instead gave the preference to, to other subjects which were a bit underrepresented in the talk voting results. So, the, the voting results were used as basis for the selections, but I think it's it's already a, a large step forward because we you don't have this kind of committee um, decision process for the for the for the talks, where you sometimes get biases from from those committees in, into the talk selection. So um, that yeah. happens sometimes yeah, with yeah, conferences. Really, but if everyone is voting, and it's a like a decision of everyone to have certain kind of talks, then I think that's a community decision. Like the community decided they want to have 10 async. Uh, I just wanted to, to make one comment um, that takes account on in also like um, why the, the talk voting was introduced in 2011 um, and there was a progression um, on one side, imagine handling what, 300 talks that you need to uh, uh, review, uh, look at it. Um, and it turns out that public voting, if you see the people voting, I don't think anyone vote all the, the talks. I did, can't remember anyone that actually voted every talk. It's, you, you need to spend the whole day clicking. clicking, oh, clicking. I, I totally it's a very agree. Diffi a difficult thing. And it's a very interesting topic. Um, we picked what seemed to be the better compromise. That's ac actually that there are many theories about how we should do this. It's a very inter interesting dis discussion. So uh, all the, the source uh, is, op is open source. Um, we could try and, and maybe put some um, link regarding the, the algorithms we ha have used. Uh, if you care uh, about that and uh, you want to, to improve it, uh, I, I would really like invite you to make suggestions or try and improve that. Uh, we are all open to, to, to improve next year. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it from the perspective too. of a person that is willing to contribute to that. No, no, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> it's not like really, really a, a, a completely a clean discussion. It's, it's really because it's a hard thing to, to do. Yes. And the thing that we, we chose to not do everything voted is because uh, to avoid some, some sort of bugs in, 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 in the, the, the attendees' uh, preferences. Like uh, we care a lot about diversity. We care a lot about giving the opportunity to everyone to talk. So uh, people are biased by their friends, by biased by people that they already know. So it would be hard for someone like young that don't have uh, enough experience, that don't have enough uh, visibility to get into talking just because someone that is really known have 10 talks, you know. So it's a hard, the hard thing to balance. It's really hard. And just to close, this year the, the program work group was fairly limited. Like, <laughs> you, can, you can understand by people laughing, <laughs> okay? So the program work group is really like more or less in the front row. <laughs> Uh, so, no, no, there are more, there are more. It's just to say that we had a lot of, uh, yes, yes, sorry, I don't, don't know. But I, I, I can count on two hands. Uh, and we made a lot of requests for people to contribute. So really, if you care or other people care about doing this, we are open, open arms. I just wanted to add one thing because we have to switch to the General What's Assembly that? now. Um, if you want to sign up for one of these work groups and you're interested in helping out and improving your price and how it's organized, then, then please uh, submit uh, an application request for that. You go to our website. Where's my mouse? There it is. You go to the website. You go to Europe Python work groups. 
And this lists all the work groups again. And at the very bottom, you, um, where is it? There you go. At the very bottom, you see this, the uh, mailing address here, the, the board mailing address, and then you just send an email there, say, okay, I would like to work in this and that and that work group, and then uh, basically we set you up for it. No, no, you don't have to re-sign up. No, no, no. The, the, the whole, uh, the, the idea behind the work groups is that they persist from year to year, and and you can stay as long as you want to. If you don't want to be on the work group anymore, you can just um, tell us, and then we just uh, remove you from the work group again. So it's a very kind of open process. We, we're not making any big restrictions there. The, the only thing that we sometimes do is we ask the, the, the chairs of, of those work groups whether they need more help in a specific area, because sometimes people sign up for multiple work groups, and then we, we, we um, sign them up for those work groups that need more help rather than um, work groups that are very popular. For example, the program work group was very popular, so we had lots and lots of members in it. Unfortunately, not uh, all these members were really active, so in, in the end, even though we had lots of members in the work group, um, the, the actual work was only done by very few people. And we, we've seen similar things in other work groups, but the, for the program work group, it was, uh, it was really um, an, an exception. So. We're trying to change that, and if you have suggestions on how to change that, that would be very welcome, because we don't really know how to address this. One, one suggest suggestion um, that was made was, for example, to, um, to, to assign tasks to people and do that specifically, so tell someone to do a certain task and come back maybe in two weeks and with that finished task, to do it that way so that people feel addressed and don't, um, just see something happening on the mailing list and then thinking that, well, someone's going to do it anyway, so uh, I don't have to look into this. Um, that may be one way to, to try to improve this. We'll have to experiment with that a bit. If you have other suggestions, uh, yeah, please, please tell us, because, I mean, this is, we're all volunteers, we're all working together, and um, we don't want to put too much pressure on people, but on the other hand, we also don't want to have a few people uh, burn out because they have to do too much work. There was one question back there, yeah? Me? Ah, over here, yeah, much Yeah, I wanted to, first of all, all of you have to know that the, I was involved in the program, uh, program uh, work group. I saw people corresponding in email at two or three in the morning, right? They work very, very hard, okay? Uh, all of us, I make a very little contribution, but all, all of you was something uh, huge, the, the work that you did here. For my point about the, the voting that we were uh, talking now, uh, I and I'm thinking other people uh, were in, in some kind of deadlock situation. I, I wanted to come here. I submitted a proposal uh, when it was uh, the, the submission of proposals. And my, uh, my university financed my, my, my uh, arrival here in condition that my proposal will, will be accepted. But, uh, but I could not, uh, I could not vote if I uh, not pay the ticket. But if I don't have the budget, I cannot pay the ticket. But <laughs> I don't have the budget because yes. uh, my proposal was not, uh, was not uh, accepted. Then right. it was a, a deadlock. In the last I, I paid from my pocket for the ticket and then voted. And my proposal was accepted as a poster, and then I received the financial aid of, of the university. Then we have to, to find some way that people that uh, presented, uh, submitted a proposal but did not pay the ticket will be able to, to vote uh, for, for all, all the, the, the proposals, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they have the money, they will be able to, to pay for the ticket. It's, 
it's a it's a, a complicated situation i know it's not something so so simple but we have to think what is the best solution for this deadlock situation we'll have to experiment with that a bit um, we uh, actually we, we simply took the the code that was there and just switched it on and basically let the web code uh, uh, take care of this and um, I'm not really sure. I, I, I did one experiment and I found that you don't actually have to buy a ticket to do the talk voting. But maybe that was just because my user account is switched on as a staff account. I don't know. Could be. So we definitely have to look into that for the future. Yeah. I actually didn't want to refer to that, but um, I'll quickly add to that that also people who um, ask for financial aid and um, won't know for a while if they get it and can come here would be cool for them to also be able to vote. Um, but I, what I actually wanted to say is about the work groups, because I just had a look and the program work group is indeed huge online, <laughs> wouldn't it make sense to maybe kick people out again that do not contribute? Because otherwise the groups will increase in numbers, so number of members, um, and it doesn't make sense to have like a huge list of people to refer to that don't do the work and it's just, I don't know, a handful of people who actually do the work. So. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. I think we, we should probably have some kind of policy for this. Maybe if, if a member is not active for a few months, then we, we maybe just uh, then remove that member from the, from the work group because otherwise it wouldn't make sense, like you say. Yeah, yeah just Jacob? Okay. Just well, that's the last question because last we question. have to start with uh, the... A last comment about uh, as we have, are having about, uh, a lot of ideas and new things, uh, wha actually another thing that we would like to um, is to be more, try to, to be more open and transparent during the process to uh, also uh, let people know more about how much we are spending or on financial aid, how much we spend, because financial aid is a very difficult topic because it's hard to say how much we'll be able to, to spend. Uh, many, many times we, we did financial aid and helped with a red budget situation, you know, risking a lot of things just because. No, 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 no. I, I, I wanted to, to add this to, to, to the discussion saying that um, as much as the community uh, understand the difficulties of, of doing this, uh, um, the more, uh, maybe people can make suggestions or ideas about how we can tackle those problems. That's that. I would like to look a little beyond 2016. Uh, I think it's really, really important for EuroPython to have a vision about where we want to go. Uh, I'm actually uh, uh, somewhat involved uh, in uh, how EuroPython got to where it is today, because uh, I was the founder of the EuroPython Society, and uh, I influenced the decision to go to CERN, to Vilnius, to uh, Britain, and uh, to Italy. And we had an idea of why we were doing this each time. We went to Vilnius because we want to spread Python in Eastern Europe. We need a vision in what we're doing. And it's not enough just to think about what are we going to do next year. We have to think about what w direction do we want to take. Something I see as a problem right now is that I find many of the talks rather boring. There are no uh, really new inspirational talks at EuroPython this year. And I think that's something we need to address. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we need to do this as well, but yes. Uh, sorry? No, no, I, it, it's an opinion, it, I, I fully agree, I fully agree. And, but I, f I also think that this vision should be shared with more people. Um, this year was a turnkey year, and I think that um, 
we need to build something uh, uh, that is more than a group of people uh, and is a, is a more engaged community that dr drives those decisions, drive those visions. It's, it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, it's, it's easy to just take uh, for granted that it's going to be a new year Python next year. And it, I would like that it would be like, not obvious, but this vision is, is, is much more open. And we, we have a lot of people, uh, vibrant people from Eastern Europe. Uh, that means that we would like to have more teams proposing from East, Eastern Europe. We would like to, to have more work group members for, from that part, that region of Europe. So that's part of the, the, the plan that we are trying to bring. And I think we are running uh, okay, out of time. Okay, we, we need Sorry. to start with the General Assembly.